are you guys doing? Hey, man, well, a little family reunion there. That's good stuff. I want to welcome you to the Lord's Table. If you don't know me, my name is Ken, and uh, I am a Carolina Panthers fan. I don't know if that's a confession or a, it's a little weird. I just wanted to say it because no one else is it, but uh, I know some of y'all are going to be looking at your phones because I know they're playing right now, so it's a little weird for church folks, but trust me, uh, you should be able to catch the second half of the game. I don't think I have that much to say today, so <laughs> hang in there, all right? Uh, I just want to welcome you uh, this morning. I know it's a great, great, beautiful day out there, and you chose to come and to worship together right here at the Lord's table. I want to thank you for that. Uh, it is always encouraging to be around other believers. Amen? Amen? I met a young, very young lady this morning, and she was walking in, and the beautiful thing about kids is they don't want to fake it, right? It was obvious that she was not having a good morning, and I, I told her, I said, uh, I said, hey, it's okay. I was feeling the same way when I got up. You just got to smile your way through it sometimes. So uh, if you're having one of those mornings, I pray that it turns around. And uh, I don't know how it couldn't after being in the presence of the Lord this morning. So glad you're here. Uh, we are going to start a new series this month that is, t that is titled, So What? So What? You know, a lot of us look around in life and there's so much going on and we have all these things coming at us. I don't know, if, I don't know about you. Maybe it's me. Sometimes... Just the speed of life and the sheer amount of information and dilemma and calamity and all that stuff is, is just overwhelming to where the point, you get to the point where you're kind of like, so what? Not so what like this, but S-O what? So what? So what if there's another disaster? So what if there's another dilemma? So what? Because it never ends, does it? As soon as one gets solved or before, we're on to the next one. And so uh, the challenge for us as believers is to decide who we want to be. Uh, as people and what we're called to be as God's people. And it has a lot to do with what we're going to talk about over the next few weeks, which is uh, sowing, sowing, S-O-W, which is an old word for planting, but it's cool because we don't use it all the time, so we use it. So what, right? Uh, so if you would join me, I'd love to pray before we jump in and see uh, what the Lord has to say to us this morning. Father, I thank you this morning for your goodness, for your word, for your grace, for your salvation, for your presence. There's no, no shortage of what we have to be thankful for. And so, God, we just lift up the name of Jesus this morning. We pray that your Holy Spirit would be the loudest voice in the room. Teach us exactly what you want us to learn, God, each one of us, individually and as well as collectively. We just ask that you'll do it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, uh, just so I want to make sure you know, I mean, some people know and some people don't, but sowing and reaping are are terms that we're going to keep using over and over again over the next few weeks. But if you haven't been around a church or you haven't been reading the Bible, uh, those words, I don't know, they seem a little odd. Um, but it's simply planting and harvesting, planting and harvesting. So, you know, as we begin to read through these things, I just want to make sure that, you know, you're not a miss of that. I'm not trying to be condescending, but whenever I first came to church, I didn't understand what all these words meant because I didn't grow up hearing the King James language and I didn't grow up hearing biblical language. And so I wanted to just throw that out there. And I wanted to lead you first off into Psalm 126 out of the scriptures, starting in verse 4. Uh, the scripture says this, Restore our fortunes, Lord, as streams uh, renew the desert. Those who plant in tears will harvest with shouts of joy. They weep as they go to plant their seed, but they sing as they return with a harvest. Sometimes it's, it's tough for me to think, uh, what is the scripture really saying without shifting gears into understanding that when the Bible was written, everything wasn't um, economically based in currency like we do now. So money is our currency. But really, back then, a lot of it had to do, it was very um, agricultural and, 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 and herd-driven, animals, whatnot. And so when we read, we have to hear the heart of what the, what the person's saying. And so I kind of read this, and, and I know, number one, uh, where it says, restore our fortunes, Lord. Uh, that word fortunes is, uh, is also translated in, in maybe some other translations, is, is bring us back to our former glory, Lord. Bring us, restore back to us something that we once had. And we're all inevitably going to run into a place where we've had more than we've got now, or we've had a, you know, we call them the glory days. Anybody, anybody with me? 
You know, we all love to think about the glory days. The bad news is, is today is tomorrow's glory day. So uh, you got to remember, you got to bring all the glory into the day you can because you'll be looking back on today at some point where you thought, man, if I could just get back to where I was at that point. And, and we're all somewhere along the continuum in that journey, and, and we're all trying to figure this thing out. But, but the writer here is saying, you know, bring us back to a place where we once were. Uh, and, and it's funny, he shifts gears and begins to write in here that those that plant in tears will harvest with shouts of joy. And I thought, why would you plant in tears? Why does this keep coming up? It says they weep as they go out to plant their seed. And I would think that you wouldn't weep when you go plant seed. Until I had a couple conversations with my son-in-law and his father who are farmers. I needed some insight. I didn't really know. And when he told me how much it costs to plant a field... I know why they weep. It's, that's a lot of money. Yeah, I think we, you know, I'm not a farmer, so I think, hey, man, you just go down to Lowe's, grab your pack of seeds, throw them out in the field, and a bunch of stuff pops up. But that's as, that's as simplistic as you can get on it. It's, it's a lot more involved than that. But I want you to think of it in this term, that if you look at what you have, all that you have, and, and you look in terms of planting and harvesting, uh, we can, we can kind of understand uh, this idea of sowing in tears because to plant something, you've got to invest something. Planting isn't just scattering seed that has no value. When you think about this, you're scattering back then. Let's just use wheat, for example, back then. They ate the seed from the wheat, but to get more wheat, they had to take part of their portion, part of the food that was going to feed them, through the growing season, through the off season, they had to take a portion of that and remove it from their possession and put it into the ground so that it would have another harvest, so they could have more. One of the things that, uh, that is tough for us to imagine, and, and it's just, I'll just put it simple, I thought of it in these terms, that, um, that if I had to take the food that I ate and divide it, I don't know what the percentage is, but let's say I just had to live off of half. And half of every hamburger I ate, I had to take half of it and go put it in the ground. That would be pointless because apparently hamburgers don't grow in the ground. But maybe the lettuce would. I don't know. Um, something would come up. Maybe. Probably nothing. But, but think of it in terms of, of that. And that's why it says that they'll, they, they, they sow in tears because there's an investment, a real tangible investment when we sow. And I think a lot of us think about this in terms sometimes that, that, that sowing is easy, but sowing isn't easy. Planting isn't easy because the seed has value. If sowing is easy for me, I'm not sowing the right thing because I'm sowing something that doesn't have any value. I'll say it again. If sowing is simple and easy for me, then I need to rethink it because I'm not sowing what is of value. That, that literally it says that, that they weep as they go to plant their seed. They weep. Why? Because that, that's real food in their hands. And they have to enter into a place of trust and faith as they go out to sow this, that it will somehow reap a harvest that's bountiful. I was talking to my, uh, my friend Alan, who, like I said, is my son-in-law's dad, and he was talking to me about uh, we were talking about cotton. So I was just trying to get my head wrapped around this. That, that to plant six acres of cotton, I'm going to see if I get this right, it takes about eight pounds of cotton seed. So we think, oh, that's, that's not a big deal, right? It would be a small bag. That's not a big deal, except when you figure out that to plant six acres of cotton costs about $23,000. So, so cotton seed ain't no joke, Right? So, so when you think about that, now you and I go, oh, that's no big deal, planting six acres. Okay, well, let's talk what, what those of us that aren't farmers know, cash. So, so, so for you to take $23,000 of your cash and spread it around the field in hopes, in faith, that this process will work and it will yield something greater than what it is. You can... I was asking, I said, well, what does that mean? What does that equate to? He said, so you take uh, roughly at harvest, an acre of cotton will harvest about 1,000 pounds of cotton on average, some 1,300 pounds, some 700 pounds, but on average, you're looking for that. And so when we look at this idea of sowing and reaping that the Bible talks about, it's at work, 
I mean, we live in an agricultural area, so it's at work day in and day out. When we drive the fields, we look, and I say, oh, that's a pretty cotton field, but I have nothing invested in it. To the farmer, this is livelihood. This is life. It's his investment. And at some point, he, he stepped into this cycle. So we say there's four seasons, right? Winter spring, summer, and fall. I think for the farmer, there's four seasons. There's planting, growing, harvesting, and rest. And apparently rest lasts about three days. It's a very short season for the farmer, but they get to exhale when everything goes in and then automatically look right back into it. And I think for us to look at the seasons of our life that way is very good. Uh, not the three-day rest, but, but definitely figuring out that we're always planting, we're always sowing, we're always in a season of watching what, we, what we've sown grow, and there's a point at which we harvest it. And so for us, we have to think about that. And I want to talk real quick to you. Um, the first point being that, um, that sowing ain't easy. If you're taking notes, I'm trying to make this real simple. Sowing ain't easy. It ain't easy because what you sow has value. For the farmer to put, I mean, I'm talking, I'm talking about, you know, six acres being whatever I said, you know, uh, I can't remember the math, $23,000. Think about the fact that that, that farmer probably grows 100, 100 or more acres at a time, if not two and 300. So do the math. You will weep, you will sow in tears when you put couple hundred thousand dollars worth of, worth of seed in the field if you don't understand what I want to talk about next, which is this principle or the law of sowing and reaping. The reason I call it a law is because it doesn't, this principle that we'll talk about, it's this biblical idea of sowing and reaping that no one escapes this. So it doesn't matter whether you're, you can count yourself to be a good Christian or a bad Christian. You could be a, a bad Buddhist or a good Buddhist. You can be a businessman, an atheist, or whatever. Sowing and reaping is a principle or a law of God that will always be at work, and it doesn't depend anything on you and I. The only thing that we need to understand is how, what position are we going to take in the sowing and the reaping part. So for us, it's, 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 it's about what you sow, you reap. In Galatians Chapter 6, verse 7, this law is laid out so clear. Don't be deceived, it says, God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that he will also reap. Whatever you sow, that which you will, that, it's that that you'll reap. And a lot of us think, okay, he's talking about plants. It works in plants, so I can't plant an apple and get a watermelon. I don't get to plant peanuts and, and harvest uh, uh, celery. It's, it, that would be crazy, right? Well, the same thing is true about all things in our life, that this principle of sowing and reaping, it works even down into the level of, of our heart. Uh, so I'll show you this in Job, uh, verse, chapter 4, verse 8, it says, My experience shows that those who plant trouble and cultivate evil will harvest the same. So in Job, he looks around and he says, all those people who are, who are planting or sowing evil and trouble, they, they just have an abundance of that to sow and reap. Proverbs 22, 8 says that whoever sows injustice will reap calamity and the rod of his fury will fail. And I can't help but think about, uh, you know, all those historic figures, you know, the, the, what we call, I call them the real bad guys, right? The Hitlers, the Popots, the, all the people that have massacred and killed and the injustice that they put out, Stalin, those types, that type of stuff. You look back and you go, wow, they were so powerful and they, they literally did such evil on the face of the earth, but their rod definitely failed, didn't it? We, we don't deal with those guys anymore. And so, so it doesn't matter how powerful it looks while it's there, you have to understand that in the end, God's word is what endures forever, right? That man's efforts don't. But the reality is, is that whoever sows injustice reaps those things that are, are in tune with injustice. Amen? We all know it, right? Uh, why, we get mad. Why do good things happen to bad people? Or why do bad things happen to good people? We don't understand those things. And that's because they, they cause us to look at it and go, uh, why is it that this good, bad thing happened to this person? It doesn't mean that everything is, is a result of our sowing and reaping. But, but this idea of sowing and reaping guides us uh, and focuses us on the question, what am I sowing and what am I reaping? 
you see fruit begets fruit, right? So where is the seed located in a plant? In the fruit, right? Or or in a case of a grain, it's, it's in the head of the thing, right? So we need to understand that, that we have to plant the seed from the fruit that we want to reproduce. So if I want trouble, I should sow trouble. Serious. If I want drama, I should sow drama. You know these people. They never, ever, ever run out of drama. They got a good crop going. They got a good cycle. They're always planting, always harvesting, and there's always something growing. Right? You know these people. And it's like, how do you never run out of drama? Well, it's because that's your, that's your cash crop. It's what you're investing in. This is the truth. It's not pleasant, but it forces me to say, and when I look in the field of my life, what am I planting? And what I'm planting is often identified by what am I harvesting? What am I harvesting? See, it's hard. They say that self-reflection is a tough thing. I would say it is too. But it's also not that hard because you can look at the fruit of your life. Do you have love in your life? Maybe. But if you don't, you probably should start sowing some. Do you have peace in your life? If not, you should buy some peace and invest it in the ground of your life, right? So, so think about that. That fruit, it, I don't even, it's kind of funny how simple this is. For me to say you reap what you harvest, people go, that makes sense. But even in our life. So it's interesting that when God talked about uh, in the scriptures what we were given when we received the Holy Spirit, what did he describe it as? Fruit. The fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, uh, self-control. And there's another one I always forget. I probably don't have that much of that going on. Did I say gentleness? <laughs> Maybe. So we get this faithfulness. That's what it was. Thanks. Um, when we look at this, that we've been given this fruit of the Spirit... We've been given what we need to sow so that we can reap those things in our life. We all want those, don't we? I mean, if you had a list of, of things that you could have in your life, those things are great. But it's not just that we imitate those things. It's that we, we take those things and we invest those things by sowing them into the lives of other people. So it's not enough that I'm loving. I need to purposely sow love into the life of other people. Love, joy, peace. Patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, all these things should be at work, and I should, those should be the seeds that I'm, that I'm sowing day in and day out. Why? Because those are the things that I would love to reap. I would love to have those things flowing in my life. That'd be a pretty good day, right? Hey, what'd you, what'd you have going on today? Well, man, there was a lot of love, a lot of peace, a lot of joy, a lot of you know, patience, all that stuff. But yet, when I look at my life, I don't know if I sow those things as much as I sow the opposite. That's just me being honest. So when I say, so what, to the world, as in, so what, I don't care what's going on, that's wrong because, because the Lord gives me seed to sow as a believer. And if the church at large, not just us, but if believers at large will begin to take the responsibility of sowing and watering and reaping seriously, I think our world will be a little different. You see, a lot of times I find myself, I, I sow uh, um, contempt for the world. I can't believe they're doing that. Well, yeah, I can. They're a bunch of scoundrels, right? So I, that's not so. I, I say, you know what? There's, I've got to be patient with that, but sow the right thing. In love, share the truth. In love, be faithful to, to God's word. In love, do all the things I'm supposed to do, sowing the seed of the fruit of the Spirit. Is this making sense? So the first one was sowing ain't easy. The second one is you sow what you reap. And here's the third one um, that I want to share a scripture with you in because it's, it's the reason why I think we don't sow as much as we do. And the third principle is this, if you're taking notes. Uh, I don't know how, I didn't know how to say this one. Uh, you got to risk it for the biscuit. 
I don't know. Is that, is that a good way to put it? Uh, the, uh, this idea of, especially if you're sowing wheat, right? You really have to risk it for the biscuit. But, but you have to understand that there's risk in sowing and reaping. But we, out of fear, so often refuse to sow the seeds that God's given us that, that we just hold back. Why do we hold back? And is it just us? No. It's in Ecclesiastes 11.4. It says this, that farmers who wait for perfect weather never plant. If they watch every cloud, they never harvest. And so for you and I, looking at ourselves as farmers, not necessarily literal farmers, but farmers, we're always sowing, we're always in a growing season, and we're always seeing reaping, then we need to understand that we have to take some risks. There's, it's not always going to look just right. It's not always going to look just right. You're going to look at some people and go, they're not worth sowing into They're not just right. I don't know if I should invest in that person because, well, they just don't, the ground doesn't look right. Uh, It doesn't look like a ripe uh, ripe area. Now, you have to be careful. You can't just throw it all out there in nothing. But, But a lot of us make a lot of excuses as to why we don't invest and sow in life. It doesn't feel right, or it doesn't look just right, or it doesn't seem like that that it's going to be there. And so he says that if you wait for perfect uh, weather, you'll never plan. If you always wait for the perfect situation to invest, to sow, then you'll always be able to find a reason not to. You'll see one little cloud in the sky and go, ah, I can't do it now. It's going to be too wet, or, 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 well, I can't do it now because it might be too dry, or I don't want to do it right now. And if I don't do it now, then, well, it's a little too late. I mean, I could have done it back then, but now it doesn't have time to grow, so I'm not going to plant at all. And when you don't do that, the scripture says that they don't ever reap a harvest. And so for those of us that that live this life, a lot of us uh, live under this concept of security, that that we'll be safe. We'll create this very, very um, um, inactive, very a stable kind of environment for ourselves so that we're not at risk in any way. The problem is that we don't ever reap a harvest. We don't reap a harvest because we're not investing in that. Uh, I just make this very practical. My question to myself is often, who have you shared uh, Christ with lately? Personally, it's easy for me to default and go, well, you preach every Sunday. I'm, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about me shaking my neighbor's hand, getting involved in their life, and then me sharing Christ in a real way with them out of a relationship-based thing. And oftentimes I have to say, well, I don't know. I don't know why I don't. Well, well, the reason that you haven't, that, you know, you haven't seen them come to Christ, that their life doesn't, you don't see that harvest in their life is because no one's planted it. So when you look at your neighbors, your coworkers, your friends at school, and you wonder, why don't they? I just wonder sometimes, I don't know, why, does people, why don't people just like, learn about Jesus and love him? And the real answer is that no one has sown that seed. Or people have sown the seed, and maybe your job, my job, is just to come along and water it, to, know, to manage the growing season. And then the scriptures point to the fact that sometimes somebody planted a seed and somebody watered the seed, and then you just come along and you harvest the seed. But all of us together working in this seed time and harvest principle will find out that, that it's a risk-based thing. It's not safe. It's not easy. And it takes faith to just invest valuable things into the lives of people. <laughs> Second Corinthians 9, 6. Chapter 9 of Corinthians is just so you get the context of it. And I'm not really talking about this today. Chapter 9 is about where the Apostle Paul is writing, and he's, he's talking about taking up an offering for the Christians in Jerusalem. So while he's talking in these terms of sowing and reaping, he's actually talking about uh, a material investment. But he says this. He says, the point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. He talks earlier in the Scripture, I think it's verse 2 or 4, maybe 4, in there, where he, he, he begins to say that a farmer who sows just a cup of seed will reap a very small harvest, but the one who sows bountifully reaps bountifully. And for you and I, the question is this, do we want to live a life of extravagance out of what God's done for us, or do we want to be close-fisted and greedy and not, sh- not sow things into the lives of people? That's the real question. And I don't really like this topic, if I'm being honest with you. It might be why I woke up in a bad mood this morning. Can I be real? 
that sometimes it's easier for me to just go, you know what? I'm tired of sowing. I'm tired of investing. I'm just, you know, can't just, can't you just do it, Lord? Can't you just bring in the harvest? Can't you just do a miracle? Can't you just come to somebody in a dream? Why do I have to do it? And then I realize that that is such humanistic thinking. Because the truth of the matter is, is God says, no, you get to do it. You, I'm allowing you. I'm providing them. The scripture says this. I think it's in my next scripture. But he says, I'm giving you plenty of seed to sow into the lives of other people. So the reality is that what God's asking me to sow is not, was never intended for me anyway. So God's saying, I've given you abundant seed. My problem is, though, is I, in my life in the past, I have eaten all the seed God gave me. I was like, oh, look at the Lord blessing me. Right? Good stuff. And then he goes, go and plant. And I'm going, what are you talking about? My tank's empty. I got nothing. And he's going, well, you, you messed up and ate the seed. I want you to realize that I'm giving you abundance so that you'll have plenty to sow into the lives of other people. Now, does this have to do with money? Sure. Does this have to do with faith? Sure. Does this have to do with the fruit of the Spirit? Absolutely. You see, God's not just talking about material stuff, and that's why I really want to get you to understand this, because so often in church, we use sowing and reaping, strict, sowing and reaping strictly in the context of giving, because Paul did just once, though. The reality is, is that we are constantly sowing something out of our life. And that, you know, that's why I wanted to bring up Job 4 and Proverbs 22 is, is this idea that we, we can sow trouble, we can sow injustice, we can sow justice, and we can sow um, peace, and we can sow good things into the lives of other people, and then we reap the harvest of that. And if you re reap a harvest that is bountiful, then you've got plenty of seed to go back into it. I think the thing for me is, and for you, is that we have to realize that, that this labor that God's called us to, that's what it is. It's a labor. It's something that I have to pay attention to. My, my son-in-law does not accidentally harvest uh, hundreds of acres of cotton every fall. They, their family does not wake up and look out and go, huh, I wonder where all this cotton came from. Well, we might as well pick it up. And for you and I, that's kind of how we act in our faith life. We look around, we go, oh, look, there's some, let's, you know. But it, it's not accidental. It's God's people sowing God's seed into the earth so that we can see, after a growing season, a plentiful harvest. Now, sometimes we are the harvester. That's true. Sometimes we don't know how it got there. It's just easy pickings, Right? We had, we joke around about this one time, but one time we had a meeting. We don't really have business meetings at the Lord's table, but we had a meeting that was kind of about some business things that were going on. And, and we talked about um, uh, money and where we were going to invest, kind of like we talk about, like we're doing this thing with the kids thing. We take time and we bring people in. Hey, this is an exciting thing. We're gonna, this, this, this. And, and all of a sudden, sort of just out of who we are, we're like, hey, by the way, before we leave, does anybody want to get saved? And one dude's like, and we didn't even talk about Jesus. That's an example of where the harvest just pops up. Okay, we're ready. We'll, we'll harvest that soul. But it wasn't us who planted it. It wasn't us who watered it. Somebody did, and we were ready to do that. So the reality is, is that we're constantly sowing the seed of grace, the seeds of mercy, the seeds of salvation, all the fruit of the Spirit, all those things that we're constantly sowing. But even in that, you know, we have to realize that, that, that there's a growing season, so, uh, and, I, and I think we're going to get into this more as we get into the series, that we, it's, our, our problem isn't in the sewing, to be honest with you. We can all actually go out of here, and some will go to restaurants, some might go home, whatever. But by the end of the day, we can create an encounter with someone where we can sow a seed of grace, love, mercy into someone's life. Our problem isn't with that. Our problem really isn't with receiving the harvest. Our problem is in the growing season. It's the gestation and the growing and the forming and the watering and the waiting that is horrible, right? 
because you're all busy in the sowing season. Farmers are not worried in the, in the sowing season. They don't worry. They don't worry about that stuff. They're like, we've got to get it in, right? That's what they say. We've got to get it in. And once they got it in, now all of a sudden they start thinking what they got in and they start thinking, is it going to come out? And worry can creep in. And they have to be faithful. And they have to understand this law of sowing and reaping. You and I are the same way. Sometimes we'll sow seed and we'll expect the next day to come back and find a fully formed plant. And I'll just tell you, if you ever sow a seed in your yard, like go plant a little tomato seed or something, if you come out the next day and it is fully grown and has tomatoes, don't eat those tomatoes. <laughs> Somebody's playing a horrible trick on you and it's probably not going to be good for you, right? But there's a truth in this that we have to understand that, that we're always going to get into a rhythm, a rhythm. The problem is, is that as believers, we know God does miracles. And, and we would rather have the miracle than the, than the principle of sowing and reaping. We would, we would rather that God forego all of that and just give us what we want. And God's saying, that's not how it's supposed to work. Because I need you to understand this principle that I put into place, that what you sow, you will reap. And in doing that, he builds something in us that is bigger than whatever we thought would happen if we could just get the thing. I don't grow very many vegetables. I do grow a few. But the ones that I grow, I like them better than the ones that I buy because I watched them grow. I went in my backyard and I picked them. My tomatoes aren't that good. But to me, they taste better than the really good tomatoes that are in the grocery store. Why? Because they're in my yard. I see them. I, you know, I, I go out there and water them and do those things. And I love it. And the reality is, is that in our lives, when we sow and we reap what we've sown, it creates something in us that we see, man, God really is faithful. He really does do this type of stuff. And it's good. 2 Corinthians 9.10 says this, This generous God who supplies abundant seed for the farmer, which becomes bread for our meals, is even more extravagant towards you. First, he supplies every need, plus more. Remember that. Then he multiplies the seed as you sow it so that the harvest of your generosity will grow. See, remember, God's using this principle of sowing and reaping to, to show us, one, God's abundance, two, this idea of generosity because it reflects his character, not ours. Most people, uh, they will say, have, are, are, we're selfish. And there are, I've heard arguments even that even when we're doing what people will call good things, we're still doing it for selfish reasons. So I will help you, but they'll say that I didn't help you because I'm good. I helped you because helping you made me feel good, which is selfish. That's just a horrible way of thinking. Could be true. But the reality of all that is that God has given us a system to trump all that. He's saying, I want you to sow generously so that you harvest generously so that I can return to you everything that you've sown plus more then when you go back out and you sow some seed for every handful of seed you pull out of the bag I'm gonna add another handful and so we're constantly sowing this multiplied seed that God gives us this is the miraculous right so what we've done is we flipped it around we want a multiplied harvest where God's saying I'm giving you multiple I'm multiplying the seed you sow we're going no multiply the harvest without doing that and it's backwards anybody with me I want it I want God to make me healthy and strong in my old age but I'm sowing Twinkies and Ding Dongs you know what I mean? It's like, no, that's not, you know, you got to sow on the front end to reap what. So he's saying, if you, if you just give that up and sow good, then I'll multiply what you're sowing and you'll see it multiplied in the harvest where we're going, no, just skip to the harvest and multiply that. And God's going, why? I, I want to do it up here. So we're, we're shaking our fists at God. Why, God, why aren't you doing this miraculous thing in my life? And he's going, I am. You got a bag of seed, and every handful you throw out, I'm going to put another handful on top of it, and there's going to be a plentiful harvest. But we're, we never sow the seed because we're looking at a harvest that we don't like. And so for us as believers, we have to flip the script and go, you know what? I don't, I, my job isn't to worry about the harvest. My job is to get into the business of sowing. Sowing God's seed, sowing good things, sowing all those things. Amen? And it's worth saying this. For some of us, you know, this, this principle is bigger than just the sowing and reaping thing. 
This thing is bigger because it, it, we can begin to use this and say, okay, I am sowing. I'll just pick one. I've been using it anyway. Love. I'm sowing love, but I'm reaping hate. You just need to realize that if that ever happens, the same way if you sow tomatoes and you get grapes, you know something's not right, right? So if you're sowing love and you can say without a doubt, I've stopped speaking words of hate. I've stopped gossiping. I've stopped lying. I've stopped all those things. And what I'm sowing is pure seeds of love and I'm getting hate. Then I'm just going to tell you, you can look for the enemy to at work in that. You want to see where the enemy's working? Look at where he's switching up seed on you. And that's where you just begin to claim, Lord, I sowed love. And you said I would reap love. You destroy the works of the enemy. You take him on. I can't watch it all the time. You do it. That's, what, that's, that's where God, God is always going to be at work protecting his word. So if you're sowing one thing and reaping another, just go to God about it. Lord, wait a minute. In Galatians, you said that I'm going to reap what I sow. I'm tired of reaping what I haven't been sowing. Help it out. Work in it. And watch him do it. He's the protector of his word. He's the one that does it, not, not you and I. Amen? That's good. I think it's good. So, let me just say real quick, one last time. Sowing ain't easy. You reap what you sow. You got to risk it for the biscuit. And God's miracle comes in the sowing more than the harvest. So as we realize these things, then we can begin to understand that, that God wants me to be in the business of planting. He wants me to be in the business of sowing. He wants me to be in the business of watching the harvest come in. More so than he wants me to be in the business of miracles, to be honest with you. He's built the miracle in to the principle, into the law of sowing and reaping, and he invites us into it. And frankly, it's just pretty easy. Amen? So this morning, I want to invite you if you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, to consider this, that the investment that God made to reap a salvation for all the people that have ever lived, he planted a seed. That seed we know as Jesus. Like a seed goes into the earth, Jesus, who is God's only begotten Son, was sent into the earth like a seed has to die before it can produce Jesus willingly died like a seed after it dies springs forth out of the ground alive it took three days and Jesus sprung forth out of the ground alive we call it resurrection so God even worked in the principle of sowing and reaping when he invites us into his salvation if you're here this morning and you never believe that Jesus is a savior but you want to then I want to invite you to pray this prayer with me online, in the room it doesn't matter scriptures say that today is a day of salvation don't wait don't wait be willing be willing to receive him today Would you mind closing your eyes, bowing your heads if you would? I just want to ask you, if you're here this morning and you want to pray this prayer, I want you to pray it with me out loud. Hold your hand up while you do. Nobody's looking, no embarrassment. just want you to lift your hand up and say, I want to pray this prayer. I want to know Jesus as my Savior. Just pray it out loud after me. Father, I've sinned. I pray that you'll forgive me for that. I accept your son Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I want to live in him forever. I want his life here and now. And I just proclaim him today, Jesus, as my Lord, as my Savior. In the mighty name of Jesus, I ask it. Amen. 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 Come on, let's give Jesus a hand.